My story is about passion. It's about hybridity. It's about diversity. It's about how to use a natural heritage as an asset for sustainable development. As you see on the picture, there's a toad. I'm very fond of amphibians and snakes. And that's where my passion started. And I will tell you that story, how passion can be a nice thing to work with towards a big, big story. And for all the people who are trying to set up a, a, an own business on social uh, entrepreneurship or whatever, remember the words of Mahatma Gandhi. He said once, first they ignore you, then they laugh with you, then they fight you, and then you win. It's a story of many people, many entrepreneurs, I think, who wants to change differently. My story began when I was like eight, nine years old, where I was, where I was playing in the, med, in the meadows, backyard in my at my, my, my house, and at a certain point, I saw a ladybird, that beautiful little insect. And immediately I thought, that must be mine. So I ran out inside, my father, was a, who was a miner, I'm living in the Limburg region, in, in northeastern of Belgium. I stole his box of matches, put out the matches, ran back to the hedge, tried to find my ladybird, and in the end I found it. I put it in the box of matches, I thought it ate grass leaves, so I put some grass leaves in the box of matches, and it was mine. So I opened the box of matches 80 times a day, and it was beautiful. But you know what happens after three days? My ladybird died. And later I understood that it was a very, very good story about life. Because if you close down, if you don't give space to nature, if you don't give light to nature, if you pollute nature, the sulfur of the matches, it dies. Later on, when I became 18, 19 years, I was really fond on herpetology then, I found a really rare species in Flanders, the midwife toad. You see a picture of that. But the, the midwife toad is very abundant in Spain, so I traveled to Spain to see and to research on the midwife toad. And I came home again, but at that time I thought that a little bit scientific to my dad would be good, because they always talk in Latin if you talk in, on species. So I came in, came in and I, my daddy was reading the newspaper. And I said, Dad, Dad, do you know what I have seen in Spain? He said, hmm. He said, I have seen Alites Obstetricas which is the name of the midwife toad. And do you know what he answers? He said, and who won? He thought that I was going to watch a football match in Spain. So at that time, I, re I, I, I realized that translating biodiversity into a language that people could understand was much important. Later on, I discovered that there was something going wrong, really wrong. All species, all Nature, all, uh, all life on earth is really, really falling apart. Something is going on. How to deal with that? Do you think a polar bear knows how valuable he is? Or a tree frog or whatever, or a badger? Do you know? They, they know that. No, they don't know. They're just there. They appear. They're appearing there. But if we think a polar bear is important, then we will do something. Then we will try and save them. So that was my next step. The other thing, what goes down goes up. You see, population growth worldwide is really going fast. How to deal with that? Does nature, does the natural heritage, does species have space to live in? How to deal with that? And how to deal with all the circumstances that occurred after growing that big in population growth. The climate change, where I'm now part of the, uh, corporate, uh, the leadership corps of Al Gore, but what we see now in the south of England of last year in Germany with, with the, the flooding of the Danube is something that we put in the air, the carbon dioxide, 30 years ago. 
So the effect, there is a delay on the effect on climate change of 30 years. How to deal with all those things? Is it possible to change? Because we have just one Earth, the million stars hotel we live in. How to manage that? You know, often we buy things we don't need, with money we don't have, and an environmental impact we don't want. The business sector, on the other hand, is keep on looking to the sky. The sky is a, living, is a limit. And if you keep on piling up these containers and look at this as an economic system, well, I think you know already what is going to happen, but if we don't stop this, it will stop by itself. Economy will fail, and we have to invest in the elements of economy again, in life again. Because there is a big problem. Our global ecolo uh, ecological footprint, there is something wrong. You see there the amount of earth we need for our living. And then you see, for instance, North Americans. If all the people would live like the North Americans, we need five earths, five planets. Only Asia, Pacific and Africa is living within the limits of one Earth. So how to deal with it? This is one of the big debates that's going on, besides climate change and sustainability, population growth on the United Nations level. The trend watchers, interesting group to follow, they say, if you will want to become successful in the future, you have to be latte-proofed. Oh, well, everybody knows latte macchiato, the milk and the, and the coffee. But if, you are, or if your projects are local, authentic, traceable, trustworthy and ethical, then you will become successful. And that is what I try to do. With my organization, the Regional Landscape Camp in the Maasland, we designed the reconnection model, trying to reconnect society with the natural heritage, reconnect nature with nature, reconnect people with nature, reconnect business with nature, and reconnect policy with practice. And we developed the first and only national park in Belgium at the moment. And how to design, and the, using that model was so successful, and it was, of course, in the introduction, that at the moment a lot of regions across the world are interested in it. Just simply explained, very simply and very brief, if you have your national park in the green, in the middle, every infrastructure is outside the national parks. No people are living in our national park. It's 6,000 hectares, very small in, in, in the scale of, of the world, but all the visitor facilities are located outside the national park. Know that in all national parks globally in the world, 85% in 85% of the national parks are the, the visitor facilities included in the national park. That's why now Yosemite National Park, Yellowstone Park, with 8 million visitors a year, has a lot of problems on traffic jam and pollution and so on and so forth. That's why I go to the United States in, in, in April to discuss with the National Park Service to go and to introduce <coughs> the reconnection model over there. But the second thing is that we locate all those visitor facilities close, close to the communities. The money can be earned in the local communities, family businesses again. That's what we try to do. So we can protect nature better, it's better protected, but more people can come and can join on a sustainable way. And you have a project area that is 10 times bigger than the national park. Our development area is that, is not the national park. And oh, at least at 85% at in the world, they're only focused on this. No, you have to integrate policies and go further. Just quickly, just the visitors coming over, because our national park was developed in 2006, so we can compare before and after. You see that we have now 750,000 people coming over to the national park. 30 seconds, okay. And you see the increase of all the things, all the visitors coming over with a yearly economic benefit of 24 million euros, only related to the visitors. If we relate it to the ecosystems, ecosystem services, clean air, housing, and so on and so forth, then you see that related to the national park, the annual turnover 
related directly and indirectly to the national park is 191 million euros a year and 5,000 jobs are involved. So there is something interesting. Investing in the natural heritage can be a tool for sustainable local economy and also for the social cohesion. Labeling the natural heritage could be a UNESCO heritage or a biosphere reserve or a national park is fantastic. And that is what is going now in the national park is really scaling up to the world. You see some dots on the, the map where I, we are working. And that is the last sentence I would say, think globally, act locally and change personally. Thank you. <laughs>